good evening and uh, let me welcome any one of you uh, to this uh, uh, further uh, appointment related to our uh, seminars. Uh, we are uh, launched uh, uh, this series of seminars uh, which are called the climate change and future generations uh, public ethics uh, inter uh, um, international uh, uh, seminars and labont seminars these are a series of seminars which are linking uh, uh, our research our in public ethics uh, based at santana with the uh, labont uh, uh, structure of research or labont uh, research center which is based in uh, at the university of turin and led by uh, the colleague and friend of Professor Tiziana Andina. Now, as for today, we have the pleasure to host uh, to have with us uh, Professor Matthias Frisch. Professor Frisch uh, is a professor uh, at the Concordia University and he's professor um, in Canada. Uh, he's mainly interested in uh, social and <clears throat> political philosophy, environmental ethics, uh, intergenerational justice, and 19th and 20th century European philosophy especially um, German critical theory of construction. Um, let me just uh, mention, beside a very uh, long list of publications, let me just mention uh, some of them. Uh, taking turns with the herd, phenomenology, the construction and intergenerational justice, uh, published by Stanford University Press in 2018. And uh, uh, the other main work, uh, uh, Eco Deconstruct, Econ Eco Deconstruction, Derrida and Environmental Philosophy, which is a book co edited with Bill Lyons and David Wood, uh, published uh, uh, as well in uh, 2018. We are really glad to have uh, Matthias with us uh, today because uh, uh, I'm sure we are sure that uh, through Matthias we can go deep and uh, develop uh, the part we are trying to say, which is, by the way, inserted into the main umbrella of the initiative called uh, All for Climate, which is supported by our the Italian Ministry of uh, Environment and the Ecological Transition. And the topic that uh, Professor Frisch is going to, to address is surely deeply rooted in the same rationale. Let me therefore just announce the topic, which is intergenerational turn taking and the counter Copernican revolution. And by Saying that, uh, I'm leaving the floor to Professor Frisch by thinking again uh, for uh, him for having accepted our mission. The floor is yours then. Thank you, Alberto, if I may. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Alberto and, and Fausto Corino um, for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Um, uh, it looks like you have a very good uh, group and research talk at the Santana School of Advanced Studies in Pisa. And um, my thanks also to the University of Turin uh, for for the invitation and for the support of this uh, for, of this series. Um, I think it's wonderful that you organize a series of talks on the important issue of future generations and, and climate change. I think an issue that in social, political, and moral philosophy has really been catapulted to the foreground over the last 10, 20 years or so. Um, and it's wonderful that this is happening in conjunction with Italy's preparation for COP26 in Glasgow, uh, where um, I think uh, I heard uh, Alberto, you too will be an observer. I will be there as well um, the first week. Um, so my university is also sending a very small delegation. Um, and, um, you know, I hope that we can accomplish important things uh, in, in Glasgow. So I hope to see you there. Um, it's also good to hear that the Italian ministry that is supporting uh, this lecture series, if I understand correctly, is now called the Ministry for Ecological Transition. Um, I was quite intrigued by that change of name, and I, uh, I wonder whether maybe somebody can enlighten me a little bit to the background. Um, I think um, that is uh, quite, um, uh, quite interesting. I, I, I don't know of any other um, country that has uh, change the name of its Ministry for the Environment um, in this way, and it could signal an important orientation and a shift in orientation that may be very, very welcome. So, um, this talk um, uh, is um, it's really an attempt to, there's a lot of text here and I, I won't read it all, um, but it's really an attempt to um, 
clarify a little bit more what I meant in my Taking Turns book from 2018 that Alberto just mentioned um, by the Earth taking turns with us. Um, and, and that's how it started in any case. Uh, when I had written the book, um, many respondents and critics of the book said, you know, asked me what exactly does that mean and what is the, the conception of the Earth here? Uh, what does Earth mean? Um, there is some, you know, some discussion of that in the book, of course, um, but I, I thought it worthwhile to elaborate on that. Um, but the other context is that I feel that um, the response to climate change and environmental destabilization more broadly uh, in the last 10, 15 years in, in academia has taken various uh, forms. And one of them is the discussion of the Anthropocene. So the notion of the Anthropocene as what I would call, see, there it happens. So I have to get up very briefly to turn the light back on. So forgive me. Um, yeah, so I'm back. I hope that's fine. Uh, I'll have to do this. I don't know, every half an hour or so. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sometimes a little bit worried about the notion of the Anthropocene, and I think I want to clarify that a little bit. And part of what worries me about it is that um, it, um, uh, it, it tends to generate concerns around uh, humanity uh, rather than generations. And I think it's better to think in terms of generations. And that, I think, is the, is the overall... Um, goal of the talk uh, or the, the dual goal of the talk is to on the one hand convince you that discourses around the Anthropocene important as they may be from some respects would do better um, to incorporate um, a, a notion of generational time uh, rather than just geological time um, and um, that that's basically my first section um, and um, I also think um, then that the second goal um, that uh, generational time is best understood in terms of taking turns with the earth, as the title has it um, of of my my book. Um, and um, but but that there are, it would be important to clarify what earth means. Um, and that's basically what I want to do in this talk. So first, then um, I will talk a little bit about uh, the idea of um, situating us in the Anthropocene. Um, so there there are, you know. Uh, many calls out there that uh, to respond to climate change and um, environmental destabilization more broadly, it would be good if we situated uh, human lives in geological timescales. That's what the Anthropocene asks us to do. Um, and um, I'll talk about that and I, I say, well, maybe yes, but um, it should be supplemented by generational time. To conceptualize generational time, we should talk about taking turns for the earth. Um, so I'll do that relatively briefly, that's section two. But then taking turns with the earth, I wanna say earth is not an external exchangeable object um, as we may think when we're taking turns with uh, a swing on the playground or um, a mountain hut um, as is quite common here in, in Canada in the mountains. Um, or uh, with uh, a car sharing service there, we don't have to use the car, right? Uh, we can uh, find other means of transportation, but that's not the case with the earth. Uh, and so what exactly does that mean that that's not the case with the earth that we don't have another one, right? That, um, and so the sense that uh, it is an exchangeable object um, that we could trade in the earth for another one that I think is a sense that um, goes along with um, a certain understanding of the first Copernican revolution. So I wanna talk about various proposals that I found um, in the literature around what's called the second Copernican revolution. Um, and, and that is my, my fourth section will be about um, the second Copernican revolution and what concept of the earth it might give us and um, how that might fit with the idea of taking turns with the earth. So that very roughly um, is the structure of my talk. Um, all right, so here is then the first section on the Anthropocene. So in the discourse around the Anthropocene, that proposed geological period marked by the massive, if in involuntary impact of the human on nature, one frequently hears the claim that the proper response to it is to situate the human being in deep time or in geological time. 
the time at which these impacts of humanity on nature will be legible. So, for example, um, you have two quotes here, one from Deepesh Chakrabarti's most recent book, um, but you find um, you know, similar uh, text in his famous um, 2009 article, um, The Climate of History, um, and uh, another one from my dear friend David Wood. Um, so what I want to uh, indicate here is that in both of these, there is this idea that the Anthropocene calls on us to situate ourselves in deep time or in deep history. So. Um, so here, uh, Chakrabarti writes, we need to connect deep and recorded histories and put geological time and the biological time of evolution in conversation with the time of human history and experience. Um, so that was um, Deepesh Chakrabarti uh, in his most recent book. David Wood in Deep Time, Dark Times on being geologically human. Um, so there you have it in the in the uh, subtitle, uh, he writes that geological consciousness relocates human history, not just within the history of life, but also within the history of the geological. The Anthropocene marks significant human impact on the atmosphere, the oceans, the ice caps, average temperature of the Earth's surface. It is changing what we thought we could take for granted. Um, so. Uh, there's also a call then here um, in David Wood's book um, for what he calls a geological consciousness, uh, which he thinks, in fact, displaces human history. Um, he recalls that for Freud, the first Copernican revolution constituted a tremendous wound to the human psyche, um, like Darwin and psychoanalysis after Copernicus. Um, and um, it is in this context that he writes uh, that apart from Darwin, these are changes, transformations, and displacements within human history, but what I'm calling geological consciousness, um, that is, hearing the significance of deep time displaces human history itself. So there, too, a very strong call for situating ourselves in deep time or geological time. Again, the, um, the time in which these impacts of the human on uh, the earth will be legible. So the kinds of impacts that human beings are having um, right now, um, the thinking goes, will be legible millions of years from now, um, which is why humans are a geological agent, as it were, like a meteor um, affecting the atmosphere of the earth, uh, changing um, uh, various layers that will be readable uh, millions of years from now, right? So geological time is time scaled in millions of years. Right? Now, these calls for geological consciousness, in my view, are understandable from a certain point of view. Uh, and I don't dispute the relevance of, um, uh, of this. There are, of course, a lot of questions here. For example, how this human species that is having these impacts is politically unified and over longer time frames, um, uh, how is it capable of controlling its actions and for whom, how to balance geological humility with agential control and so on. Nonetheless, I think it is understandable um, that uh, uh, we, we, uh, we match the idea of the human species as an inadvertent, unconscious actor at a geological level with our self-understanding. So that if humans are having these impacts in an inadvertent, unconscious way, one might think then, well, they should make these impacts conscious uh, and um, explicit such that they can take a gentle control over them, right? Nonetheless, um, despite the, this, the understandability of this move, I want to now articulate some worries about this. Um, so I'm just going to do this relatively briefly. Um, uh, these are some general worries about the Anthropocene. And then number four, worry number four is the one I will really um, focus on today. So I would first say that we must give ourselves the means to clearly distinguish causality and responsibility. So the human species may, may be held causally responsible for a number of environmental effects that can only be grasped collectively and cumulatively by seeing the human species as one biogeological agent. But this, of course, does not make all humans equally responsible. And morally responsible. So causal responsibility and moral responsibility would have to be clearly distinguished here. 
Now, we must, of course, also remember that humanity is geographically and socioeconomically differentiated, as Chakrabarti acknowledges, um, of course. The most significant difference here may be between the global north and the global south, where the industrialized developed north is causally much more responsible, but, and this is part of the injustice at present, much less affected by environmental harms. Um, so, um, number three here, my, my worry, um, we should avoid reliance on a single species to long, uh, dividing line. So, uh, humanity on the one hand uh, versus everything else. So, this is also a well-known concern of the discourse around the Anthropocene that um, it seems to uh, underline uh, long-standing um, divisions between the human and everything else. Um, and uh, there also we need to be careful. But above all, and this point um, I've, I've not seen in the literature, I mean, the, the first three I think are very well known and widely discussed in, in the Anthropocene literature. But the fourth one I, I have rarely, if ever, seen. And that is the point that we should think the human species not only as geographically and socioeconomically differentiated, um, but also as temporally differ differentiated. And, and, uh, and here, I think the best proposal for thinking the human species as temporally differentiated is to think of it in terms of generations. Now, that may require sec uh, uh, you know, another argument um, for why temporal differentiation should be thought of in terms of generations, but I'm not going to deliver that here. Um, and so I think it is, there are benefits of, um, to understanding humanity as generationally divided, uh, but also connected in both socio-ontological and moral political ways, right? Generations are also connected. There, um, there's not just division, there's also um, connection there. So uh, picking up on this last point, um, despite its virtues, I find the idea of deep time to be of limited use, if not integrated more closely with generational time. Um, the time in which generations come and go. The time um, of ancestors and descendants, perhaps the seven generations of which the Haudenosaunee Great Law of Peace speaks. And um, where I, I'm speaking to you from today in Montreal, um, and uh, I want to sort of squeeze in the land acknowledgement here, uh, is part of traditional Haudenosaunee territory. Um, and uh, Montreal uh, is called Jojage uh, for the Gonjagehaga nation um, that we recognize here as uh, the protectors of the waters and lands and the custodians um, of the territory from which I'm speaking to you today. Um, so a hint, um, going back to the talk then, a hint of this uh, lies of course already in Chakrabarti's demand to quote, um, this is just from what I, um, uh, read to you earlier, um, to put geological time at the biological time of evolution in conversation with the time of human history and experience, that is, as he puts it, to connect deep and recorded histories. Um, especially for Chakrabarti, the history of capitalism and colonialism that is inseparable from climate destabilization. Yet, recorded history is also not the same as intergenerational time frames. So, one of the ways in which this disconnect between geological and generational time manifests itself is when we look at accounts of the current inaction on environmental destabilization. Proponents of geological consciousness or of the Anthropocene of deep time and so on typically do not address what Stephen Gardner has called intergenerational buck passing and the tyranny of the contemporary in their political diagnosis of this inaction on climate change. So proponents of geological consciousness, this is the point here, um, typically don't, when they try to explain inaction on environmental destabilization, they typically don't draw on intergenerational injustices. And that, that's not part of the arsenal of explanation, typically. And maybe I'm wrong, and if I am, if you know of discourses uh, in this area, then do let me know. So what is the tyranny of the contemporary? Very briefly, this greatly exacerbated prisoner's dilemma shows that in institutional setups of modernity that encourage self-interested conduct in important areas of life, there's a very powerful temptation to engage in what Gardner calls front-loaded activities with short-term benefits, but greater long-term costs. The latter, the long-term costs, often environmental, but also infrastructural, institutional, and so on. 
This conspicuous absence of a specifically intergenerational diagnosis can also be found, um, for example, in the work of Bruno Latour, about which we will hear a little bit more later, whose diagnoses of inaction typically refer to the divide between science and politics. So, so this is often the way in, uh, in which uh, some people, some proponents of the notion of the Anthropocene will talk about um, the reasons for uh, inaction. Well, it's a problem that's only diagnosed at the level of science, but not at the level of, of politics. So some people, for example, compare the Cold War and the massive investment in responding to a, a perceived threat in the Cold War um, mm, and compare it to, to climate change and say, yeah, but there's relatively little happening when it comes to climate change compared to what happened during the Cold War. The explanation is that one is a political threat, namely in, in the Cold War, a perceived political threat. The other one is a threat that's diagnosed at the level of science and knowledge, and so is not as, as motivating, right? When in fact, I would say that um, the problem, uh, the, the, our diagnosis of this must include a reference to uh, intergenerational buck passing, that is, um, the power that the present has over future generations. Um, and so really we need an account of intergenerational injustice here uh, in order to respond to questions of uh, political motivation. And then the response to that then is that what you need is a, uh, is a theory of intergenerational justice, um, right? And that's not to say that accounts of the division between science and politics are not relevant, um, but I think it's not the whole story. There, there are other things that need to be talked about here. Okay, so um, now um, uh, I think that the biggest worry here that I have and that I want to focus on now a little bit is that this absence of an intergenerational component in the discussion around the Anthropocene leads these geological discourses, I believe, toward the focus on the human or humanity as the pro appropriate unit of profutural concern. Um, and so uh, I think um, that is part of the worry that I have um, at this point. Um, in response, I think we should attempt to separate humanity as causal agent from humanity as future concern. That is, we should try to decouple the causal story from our account of profitual responsibility, both in subject, namely all of humanity as the agent, and object, that is, uh, humanity as the concern for the con um, uh, continued existence of humanity. So, so in other words, Anthropocene discourses uh, quickly slide into saying, okay, so the worry with respect to the future is the survival of the human species. So the Anthropocene uh, is a discourse that's situated at the level of geological time and situated at the level of the human species. So the kinds of things the human species does. When this turns into a concern for the future, this turns quickly into a concern for um, uh, the human species survival. And in response to that, um, I think I just want to say that uh, this is a little bit of a different discourse here. So let me go back here. Um, in response to that, I just want to say that um, I think that's not the right unit of concern. Um, and that is in part because uh, it's too um, bedrock, it's too low level. Um, uh, IPCC reports have not predicted, uh, even on the worst case scenarios, um, the end of the human species. Um, so uh, I, I think that's not the, the right um, forward looking concern. Uh, so it aims too low, as I, I put it here, the goal of human survival aims too low. But it is also um, suspect in that it fails to take proper account of geographical and generational divisions. Um, so um, pro concern should be put in terms of generations uh, and intergenerational justice. That is the answer to pro concern, um, is what I'm trying to say here. Now, there's another worry here. I'm just going to go relatively quickly in the interest of time. I'm still in my first section, discourses of the Anthropocene and, and worries I have about that. Um, and that is um, that when you make the human species and its survival, um, the focus of your future concern, then divisions between rich and poor will um, be attenuated, will worry you a lot less. Uh, why is that? Um, because the rich are also human. So the rich can al always say, look, we have to save ourselves first because the overall goal is the survival of the human species. And look, we are human too, 
And, uh, and that I find very worrisome because it could justify um, injustices uh, of a global sort between the rich and um, the poor. And in fact, Chakrabarty, who himself, of course, um, is a post-colonial historian um, uh, and, and quite concerned about these issues, um, nonetheless, uh, you know, writes in the quote I have here, would not the survival of the rich also constitute the survival of the species? This is what he responds to critics who propose uh, speaking of the Capitalocene uh, instead of the Anthropocene, where I'm not taking a stance here on that debate, Capitalocene versus um, uh, Anthropocene. I'm just saying that the pro futural concern for survival of the human species can lead into these kinds of problems, um, namely that, oh, well, we when the rich are building their bunkers, um, well, they kind of have a justification for it. Right? Uh, so that the concern, I think, should be for um, uh, the poor and should be for the, um, the uh, intergenerational injustices. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so uh, IGJ here stands for um, intergenerational justice. Uh, there are some other um, uh, reasons why I think intergenerational justice is, is a better account um, of our pro concerns around environmental destabilization than um, species survival. Um, and here are a number of um, those worries just summed up um, very briefly. Um, I also think I already mentioned one and two. Um, number uh, three, um, uh, I think, but maybe you feel differently. I think that um, for many people, humanity and the survival of humanity is, is a very distant concept and it's not very motivating, but that's my intuition and maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, uh, what, what happens to the next generation, the most proximate generation that we're overlapping with and the kinds of environmental problems we are leaving them with that we already see happening, um, I think that motivates a lot of people more. Um, I think, but maybe you disagree. So that's just my third point. The fourth point is internal to Chakrabarty. I'm not going to go into that. Um, and um, the fifth point is about um, humanity as the agent um, uh, of um, pro concern. So not just the, the, the object of concern, but the agent of concern. And there, um, there are all kinds of questions as to how humanity can be is, um, constituted as a responsible agent. The conference I mentioned earlier, um, two weeks ago here in Montreal, Stephen Gardner gave a talk about that. Um, and maybe you know this, he's working on a book on a, what he calls the Global Constitutional Convention that is supposed to address intergenerational injustices. Okay, so uh, maybe one more point in my section one um, is that um, I think um, that we should put pro concerns also in terms of ancestors and descendants that is in terms of generations rather than in terms of humanity is also uh, something that uh, indigenous authors have argued. Uh, so many indigenous authors in North America and in uh, New Zealand, for example, have argued that the Anthropocene is very problematic because it suggests that um, there is a bleak future um, awaiting us if we don't act now, but um, that uh, we can divorce that future from the past. Um, and indigenous authors respond by saying that these kinds of um, apocalyptic narratives situated at the level of the human in general tend to erase some populations from the story, such as indigenous peoples um, who have already been through transformations of their societies induced by colonial violence that are in many ways very similar to, um, to uh, the feared consequences of climate change, such as uh, displacement from traditional territory, um, refugee status, loss of determination, loss of meaningful connection with the land and so on. And so to just look towards the future and worry about species survival um, is uh, or, or, or could be betraying an illegitimate privilege is what many indigenous authors have argued. So and instead, these indigenous authors propose uh, thinking in terms of generations, ancestors and descendants. So that is another argument um, that I'm bringing forward here. So, so those are my reasons for saying that in the Anthropocene discourse, um, whether Anthropocene or Capitalocene, what have you, uh, needs to cast its pro concern in terms of generations rather than in terms of the human species. Um, 
or or uh, simply in terms of um, worries about the environment or nature as such. So then, then we need to have an account of intergenerational justice. Now, intergenerational justice, um, I want to suggest now briefly, I think is best um, thought of when it comes to the environment in terms of generations taking turns. So that's my my second section, which is uh, significantly shorter, and it draws, of course, um, from it draws on arguments I've made elsewhere in a number of papers and in the in the Taking Turns book. Uh, so um, again, I want to say um, that um, first of all, intergenerational justice is an important lever in responding um, to environmental um, destabilization. Um, that is. Um, Again, uh, Stephen Gardner has, in my view, uh, very well argued that uh, the um, environmental responses to the environmental crisis may be put in terms of future generations. Um, and uh, also other discourses have suggested that um, the notion of sustainability is best operationalized in terms of um, justice between generations. So um, we sustain something for the sake of future generations. Um, so, uh, the further idea is that um, concern for future generations can bring together a broad cross section of the global public. So, um, often you have specialists in environmental philosophy and environmental ethics. They are concerned about nature as such, uh, inherent value, intrinsic value, and so on. Um, but uh, that is uh, not an argument that is, um, uh, or a discourse that is accepted or broadly accepted at a policy level. So, at the policy level, um, uh, I think um, you can bring together uh, specialists um, in environmental ethics as well as policymakers, as well as um, a broader public. Um, I, I think um, so. Uh, that is another reason for talking in terms of intergenerational justice. Now, as many of you know, uh, working in this area, and I know there are um, quite a lot of um, specialists in, in, in the audience um, today. Um, intergenerational justice uh, raises um, a number of what are sometimes called ontological problems. Um, the non-existence challenge, uh, future people just don't exist yet. Um, poor epistemic access, um, there's little we know at least about the distant future as to the needs of the distant future. Um, interaction problems, especially reciprocity. So Rawls famously argued that um, you know, we can do something for posterity, but it can do nothing for us. So there's no reciprocity there, and reciprocity is a, a fundamental concept of uh, political philosophy, grounding uh, relations between um, parties uh, that owe something to one another in a political context. And then there are also problems that I call world constitution problems. Uh, we um, continue to build up a world where normally we take the background of world in moral and political relations for granted. We cannot do so in the intergenerational context because part of what we're leaving behind is the notion of world. Um, and this raises all, all kinds of problems. Um, not going to go into detail here. Um, they, you know, I've written about this elsewhere. Now, um, in my in my work on intergenerational justice, um, I think that these problems are best addressed by um, uh, taking the relationship between time and normativity, uh, history and um, social and ontological relations between human beings very seriously. So to take time and historicity very very seriously. And when you do that, um, uh, I think that um, then um, certain kinds of um, concepts of intergenerational justice recommend themselves. So, for example, asymmetrical reciprocity, by which I mean that we owe to the future in part because we um, ourselves owe ourselves to the past. So the present generation always owes something to the past and thereby uh, it generates um, uh, an obligation towards the future. A concept that I've recently argued is also very widespread in indigenous accounts of intergenerational justice. So, for example, the seven generation model that I have mentioned earlier is um, often um, by indigenous authors themselves understood not as we typically think um, to project seven generations into the future, but rather three generations in the past, namely the ancestors to which we all three generations in the future and the seventh generation is the present generation. So. Um, uh, and uh, the, the overall idea then um, uh, in my work on this um, is that 
uh, rather than emphasizing the presence of the present generation and its cutoff from the past and the future, uh, we take a more um, uh, or a less linear view of time. And indigenous authors often speak of spiraling time in this context. Um, and um, uh, a notion of time that lets us see that every present is sustained by the past and the future, and that contemporary generations live of the gift and reciprocities relations with ancestors and descendants. So this would mean that time cannot be separated from space, just as generations may not be conceived as free from terrestrial, earthly, and social context, however mobile they may be, that bind generations to one another. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about this as we go on. And that is, I think, uh, why we can say that generations, um, they um, willy-nilly take turns with the earth and other quasi-holistic institutions, such as language, culture, societal institutions, and so on. Um, so um, now, uh, and as some of you know, um, on, on my telling, sharing by turns is very different from the notion of um, distributive justice that is typically um, prevalent uh, in discussions of um, intergenerational justice, namely um, what you might call the cake cutting models, <laughs> forgive me. Um, so the, the cake cutting model uh, of distributive justice, which is that uh, we share by dividing something into parts um, uh, where I'm saying, well, sharing by turns is actually quite different from sharing by parts. Um, and it has certain kinds of advantages. Some of the advantages are that sharing by turns is readily accessible to common intuitions. Um, you know, many, many different cultures have accounts of uh, what is a, uh, taking a fair turn, what that means, because it is so much part of socialization processes, right? Um, uh, to, to learn to speak a language is to wait for your turn to speak. Um, to, to, to play a board game is to, play, to wait for your turn. Uh, when there's only swing on the playground, kids have to learn to take turns, right? Taking turns is very, very deeply rooted um, in our socialization processes. So and that's good, I think, because when we all have intuitions as to what this is, it's not something uh, high level um, theoretical concept. Right? So that's, I think, is an advantage. There are some other advantages here uh, in the interest of time. I, I don't want to go into great detail. I just want to say that um, I think one of the advantages of turn taking is that it emerges out of an ontological condition that um, namely that I think, in fact, that um, generations uh, have always been taking turns with the earth. Um, because oh, with the climate, if you wish, um, because uh, it just happens to be the case that human beings are born into a generation, um, but they also die um, and leave behind uh, a world. They cannot but leave behind the world. And then the normative question is always, um, well, um, what are some better and worse ways of leaving it behind? Um, and um, turn taking respects the holistic nature of the object of turn taking. So. Um, when you have an object of turn taking that you cannot just cut apart, uh, then it suggests that you, you share it by taking turns with it. So, for example, taking turns with uh, a vacation home uh, you, uh, is you know, when it's a vacation home, it's a holistic object. If you take it apart, it's broken. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, right? So when you have an object like that, you share it by taking turns with it rather than by cutting it apart. Um, and then my argument would be that. Um, the natural environment, um, the biosphere, the earth um, is more like a vacation home than a cake that you would cut into pieces. Okay, now um, I'm going to leave it at that in the interest of time. Um, but the problem, I think, with the taking turns model so far, the way I've been talking about it so far, is that there remains a sense that justice among uh, generations is a concern only for uh, and among human beings. So um, I, I think many stewardship models um, of intergenerational justice, trusteeship models and so on, um, they, uh, they tend to, um, they get something right. Um, and I, I've just been talking about what that is, but I also, they have a danger and the danger is that 
um, that they are more or less indifferent to the object with which, um, of which they are the stewards or with which they take turns. In my case, of course, the turn taking model. So, as I said earlier in my introductory remarks, um, when we take turns with a with a car in a car sharing model, which many people do in in, uh, in major metropolises today, then uh, the um, uh, the, the uh, they don't have to use a car. There are other ways, in principle, at least, and that's not the case with the Earth. When it comes to taking turns with the Earth, we somehow, in the very model of turn taking, should take account of the fact that there's only one Earth, um, and that we are dependent upon it, and that uh, dependency and that humility with respect to the object with which we're turn taking, namely that it is not just an exchangeable object, um, that should be um, taken into account. Now, um, uh, and um, one of the ways in which I think this comes into play is that you can think of the Earth as disrupting the unity of a generation. Uh, so uh, generations don't come on stage um, on block. Uh, so they, they, you know, they're not born all at once, but rather they're sort of a constant coming and going of uh, newborn um, individuals and um, others who, who die. Um, and so it's always a question of how do you, how you individuate a generation. And um, one way in which you can think about the role of the dependency of the turn takers on the earth is that um, the earth is the one that is um, uh, always disrupting the turn taking as it were, the unity of a generation. So that the turn taker itself is disrupted um, by the earth because the earth is that which is not just an indifferent object, but is in fact involved in the very being of the turn takers uh, co-constituting them. Um, and so this is what um, I, you know, this sense is what I'm trying to do justice to by talking about uh, the earth taking turns with generations. So generations take turns with the earth, but the earth also takes turns with generations. And that is what I want to talk a little bit more about now. So, um, in this third section, I want to argue that generations do not take turns with the earth as an external instrumental exchangeable object. Rather, we are of this object, enveloped by it, even if our lives cannot just accept this and must also seek separation from it. In short, the earth turns generations about in an entangled shared agency or counter agency that needs to be accounted for. So despite the advantages promised by generational turning as a model of intergenerational relations, there remains a sense here that justice among generations is a concern only for and among human beings. I think I already um, discussed that. Um, so there is the danger that sharing and taking turns um, still takes place among humans only. I guess I already discussed that. Um, so in the way that um, uh, I said, a quasi holistic objects like the earth and the climate necessarily precede and outlive generations. So they're always before us and um, they are um, always after us, as it were, um, cons considering us as a generation. And for that reason, they are not indifferent to, but co-constitutive of the very being of generations. So this leads me to discuss a little bit more the very conception of life here. Like all organismic life, humans come to be from and pass away into the earth. We turn from the earth and toward it in breathing and eating as well as in birthing and dying. So there's a bit more of that in my book. In this sense, the terrestrial turning in fact subverts or veers of the linearity and continuity of the generational turning. The terrestrial turning sustains, but also crosses and interrupts the attempts of human generations to remain sovereign, despite the passing away of individuals. So in this sense, generational turn taking is enabled by the terrestrial turning while also being turned about um, by it. And this is because, um, I, as I, I try to say, um, I conceive of all life as defined by its attempt to return to itself. Life is never just there without activity of its own, but responding to stimuli in its environment with its own activity. The return is then always a repetition in difference or a turning in context and brings with it ineluctable change and the risk of death. The attempted return is necessarily a detour that passes through a web of differences in the environment. 
the relata of these differences do not only include humans of different generations, the dead, the living, and the unborn, but also the difference between the living and the non-living, between humans and animals, plants, viruses, uh, and the inorganic aspects of the earth. In other words, in seeking to come back to itself, the living organism must turn towards its context, the world, ranging from traditions, languages, socioeconomic circumstances to its environment prior to any culture split. From this world, the self must appropriate, even consume it literally in order to feed itself certainly. However, given that the detour through the web of differences never comes back to the same starting point, in this appropriation and consumption, there's always a remainder, an indigestible, inappropriable rest that signifies that the self is part of a larger context um, to which it is tied in a metabolic exchange. And this remainder cannot but be left behind and marks therefore the unmasterable belonging of the human to the earth. The antagonistic belonging is marked in the taking turns of breathing in and breathing out, drinking and urinating, eating and defecating, dwelling and going out into the world, being born and dying. For instance, we cannot but exhale more CO2 into the atmosphere that we leave for Earth others to inherit, thus belonging to the carbon cycle. Right? So we belong to the carbon cycle. This is a way of understanding the way in which the Earth takes turns with us. Further, we cannot prevent leaving behind our corpses or bodily remnants that the Earth will reprocess in its carbon and water cycles. I guess that's relatively obvious, right? I'm just giving a certain interpretation to that here. Such turnings anchor the generational turning in the terrestrial turning, that which we, the presently living, cannot make our own, and that was received from others is willy-nilly promised to the future other. The terrestrial turning crisscrosses generational turn-taking, which is already a turning towards self and other. The sovereign generational turn-taker wobbles in response to the terrestrial turning. With each new birth and death, but also with each new breath, the terrestrial turning makes the generational turning vibrate. Generational turning that thus has to steady and reconstitute itself until it too comes to an end. So um, that was my third section on the idea that the earth also takes turns with generations, not just generations taking turns with the earth, but also the other way around. Um, and now I want to elaborate a little bit um, on this by talk, talking about the uh, counter Copernican revolution. Um, and um, I, this is my last section. Um, so if I could have another 10 minutes or so, um, Alberto, is that fine? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and, and, and then we'll have time for discussion, I hope. Um, so now in the final and the section, I want to show that this uh, second turning, the earth turning generations about, calls for another revolution, a so-called counter Copernican revolution. That is the term that Michel Serre uses. The second Copernican revolution shows how on long time scales, Earth's own internal movement, right? this is the, the critical term here, internal movement makes generations taking turns possible while also vibrating and disrupting them even on shorter timelines today. This would mean that civil disobedience or what some people called climate sabotage on the part of a younger generation today, from Greta Thunberg to Malm Hornberg's how to blow up a pipeline, is increasingly motivated in part by this faster vibration and so springing from the terrestrial turning itself. I have a sense that I'm going relatively quickly here. These are some very new thoughts um, that I had over the course of the last week while preparing for this talk. So maybe I'll just say um, one thing rather quickly. What I'm trying to say is that the, se the second Copernican revolution is about um, the internal movement of the earth, including environmental destabilization. So, in a certain sense, environmental destabilization indicates that the Earth has always been internally on the move and not just externally on the move, as Copernicus and after him Galileo uh, uh, showed. Um, so, this is the second Copernican revolution. It stresses the internal movement of the Earth. But that movement is speeding up now, and that's what we're witnessing as climate change, ocean acidification, um, loss of biodiversity, deforestation, and so on. 
Um, and this internal movement now is particularly worrisome and triggers these ideas of the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, and so on. But it also, you know, I think one of the big political questions of our times is going to be um, uh, issues around civil disobedience um, or political resistance in the name of generational justice. So in a certain sense, that is what Greta Thunberg is doing. It's just a you know, relatively mild form of um, uh, you know, disobeying the law, namely not going to school in order to engage in climate strike. Um, but um, if you look at Malm Hornberg's um, recent book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, uh, climate sabotage can be a lot more serious. Um, and uh, the question is, um, is there any justification for it? Do we have to reckon with it? And so, I mean, many sociologists uh, say that this is going to increasingly be an issue for, um, for uh, industrialized and industrializing societies, namely resistance to the fossil fuel in infrastructure on the part of a younger generation explicitly invoking its generational status. That is, in my terminology, a question of intergenerational justice. What I'm trying to just say here is that um, this is a big issue and one that I think we should think about. Um, I'm writing a little book on Antigone in this context, where I think it's also a question, Antigone is a question of civil disobedience in the face of injustice um, towards generations. Um, but um, the issue, what I'm trying to say here is that this kind of um, climate mobilization, um, civil disobedience in the name of climate uh, ethics um, could also be understood then as uh, a response to or as part and parcel of this movement um, on the part of um, the counter Copernican revolution. So the counter Copernican revolution is not just one that, take place at, that takes place at the level of knowledge, it's also one that takes place really on the ground namely in, in the form of climate change and environmental destabilization. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say um, here relatively quickly. And as I said, this is a, a relatively new thought uh, in this context, so um, I'd be very happy to hear your comments on this. Um, so uh, now the um, Second Copernican Revolution goes along with um, viewing or responding to the first uh, Copernican Revolution and the way that Michel Serre, uh, Thomas Nail in his recent book, Theory of the Earth and um, Latour, the way they think about the first uh, Copernican Revolution is that um, for all its advantages, um, one of the disadvantages was its um, sort of uh, toning down of the agency and internal movement of the earth itself. So to, to, to make the earth move around the sun, it had to be presented as just a billiard ball, an uh, inert billiard ball that is subject to uh, causal forces and itself is just being pushed around as it were, right? Um, and so, de-emphasizing the internal movement. This is why Latour and Serre and, and Neo, they argue all in their different ways, but they argue that the, uh, what I'm calling CR1 here, so the first Copernican revolution, um, de-animated nature and over-animated humanity, right? Uh, so saw the earth as inert and only hum humans as having agency. Um, and that is no longer the case today, um, is, is the claim here. Um, so, uh, Thomas Nail begins his recent book by, by writing, we need a new theory of the earth. Most people are accustomed to treating the earth as a relatively stable place they live on and move on. Today, however, the stable ground is becoming increasingly unstable for some of us more than for others. Right? And then he gives a range of examples. Um, uh, including um, that about 50% of animal and plant species today are on the move, changing their habitat in response to um, climate change. So uh, climate change, tipping points, feedback loops, ocean acidification, the six species extinction, mass plant and animal movements induced by habit destabilizations and so on, show us that the earth system is internally on the move today, right? And so, um, I think these are some, I think this slide in the interest of time, I'm gonna uh, skip that, but it's trying to, to show that the way I understand um, taking turns with the earth and the earth taking turns with us, with, with us uh, it, it itself um, 
allows and, and um, positions the earth um, in this way that it, it is possible um, to see it as, as having this kind of a relationship um, of um, an internal movement that co-constitutes generations. But that internal movement is itself um, uh, speeding up, as it were. So there isn't just social acceleration, which Hartmut Rosa has written about so, so extensively. There is also um, the speeding up of the internal movement of the earth, and that is part of um, the second Copernican revolution. Okay, so um, that is where um, uh, what I wanted to say in this context. Um, so just as um, the first Copernican revolution famously necessitated Galileo directing his telescope to the moon and the infinite space postulated beyond to read the shadows um, as proof of the heliocentric model, the second Copernican revolution, by contrast, necessitates studying the earth by coming back down to the earth. In other words, um, the second Copernican revolution demands being humble, um, that is, in the words of Latour, being worldly, indicating the need for a third term beyond the worn out and literally disastrous nature culture dichotomy. The second Copernican revolution repatriates the earth in a finite cosmos and replaces the nature culture dichotomy with a single term without pre-given coherence and facile holism, earth or world. Um, in the case of Latour, you know, he calls it Gaia. And, but I think that um, the Heideggerian term of the world, for example, um, would be uh, you know, philosophically a richer concept to use. Um, so um, now, um, what I'm trying to say here, um, trying to sum up as, as quickly as we can. So um, the, the worry with the first Copernican revolution is in part that it presents the earth as something that belongs to an infinite space, an unbounded space. So it situates the human being in a space um, on, on a globe uh, where we are on the outside, on the surface. Um, so, um, now, if the Earth as habitat is shared, it is not shared as a common possession um, by our shared ownership of the Earth's surface. Um, so, the claim is um, that we do not so much live on the Earth as in the Earth um, of, on this telling of the Second Copernican Revolution. So, Kant's view of the Earth as uniting humanity on its surface must be linked to a uh, love it or leave it stands on the earth, as Kelly Oliver has shown. If humans don't love earth anymore or earth doesn't love us back, perhaps we can leave it. And so that, that goes along with uh, this attitude goes along with the first Copernican uh, revolution. Um, I worry. Um, so um, now, by contrast, on the view developed here, the earth is shared as that which no one can possess, the, what I call the unpossessable or the impower of death at the heart of life, what I also call the hetero in life as auto-hetero affection. Um, in this way, the second Copernican revolution appropriately responds to what you might call the shock of the Anthropocene. Namely, first, we do not have the over-animated autonomy modernity attributed to us, but instead we are dependent on the earth um, and its services, it, its ecosystems beyond our control. Second, these earth systems are unstable, fragile, and acting in response, but on their own. In short, they are on the move, a movement started by us, but taking place without us. Third, these movements are not slow and uniform, thus more predictable, but often nonlinear, turbulent, eccentric, and very hard to model and foresee, as we are now experiencing in real time with climate tipping points and feedback loops. So this calls for a certain kind of humility, um, and by humility, I mean um, humility comes from uh, the Latin uh, humus, uh, humus, uh, which means uh, soil or or earth or dirt, uh, right? So humility actually means um, a, a humbleness with respect to um, the earth, and this is what I'm I'm trying to um, mobilize here: this concept of uh, humility. Um, now, um, now, if we now need to go back to um, a term prior to the nature culture, culture split, such terms as earth and world, um, then these terms, I think, they seek to capture the conflictual and fragile ensemble of actors and, and organisms that keep the thin film of critical zones alive and livable. 
Critical zone is a key term in the recent work of uh, Bruno Latour. It refers to, uh, quote, everything that is located between the top of the upper atmosphere and the bottom of the sedimentary rock formations. The term seeks to foreground the thin, um, porous, and permeable layer where life has modified the cycles of matter by activating or catalyzing physical and chemical reactions. So in his more recent work, Latour and some of his collaborators, scientists, landscapists, and artists proposed to use the scientific language of critical zones to reimagine life on Earth in a way that spells out and concretizes my claim that we do not live on the Earth, but in it. We should flip our understanding on life on Earth in a way that one turns a globe inside out. We do not live on top of the terrestrial surface, as in Kant, but inside a thin layer, right? Um, and this is the way in which um, Latour models that. So I'm just copying this from a, from a recent article um, that Latour and others have published. Um, so it's called Giving Depth to the Surface. Um, and uh, as you can see here, you have a split. Um, uh, we, you have a, a, a flipped model um, where the outside of the globe is now on the inside. So we're moving um, from um, the typical way of presenting the earth in these concentric circles as you have it uh, under A to B, where now um, the critical zone is on the inside. So the thin biofilm, that's where life is possible and where life is modifying the atmosphere and where you have close interaction between the atmosphere and the sun on the one hand and um, the, uh, the topsoil on the other, um, that we're moving to the inside on this model. So that it makes more sense to say, look, it is, uh, we, we do not live on, um, on the surface looking outward towards infinite space, but in fact, we live on the inside um, of, a, of a thin skin, as it were, where life is possible and where life is transforming its own conditions, as it were. Now you might say, well, how does, how about the sun and so on? But you can still represent the sun here, right? And uh, you can look at the more detailed work that um, that uh, Latou and others have done on this, that you can still represent the sun as um, uh, and life as interacting with the sun, right? Um, so I'm coming to the end here. So CR1, the first Copernican revolution, offered us a planetary view of the earth as if viewed from out in space as in the famous Apollo missions photographs that Kelly Oliver discussed so beautifully in her book. Um, the space view of Earth renders life forms invisible and suggests that true knowledge of the Earth has to be gained from an outside objective view rather than from the inside of life. However, as Hans Jonas put it, only life can know life. Further, the space view of the Earth localizes any point on the surface of the Earth according to the cartographic coordinates of longitude and latitude. This static planetary view invisibilizes flows and connections between the layers and organisms inside the critical zone. By contrast, the second revolutionary view um, of the Earth um, that they propose offers a view of Earth as concrete, dynamic, interconnected, complex, heterogeneous, and reactive. On this view, the lower atmosphere that is central to life will be on the inside of nested concentric circles, as we just saw, right? And um, I think the important idea here is that the flipped view permits a better grasp of the dynamic geobiochemical flows between levels in general, and does a better job in particular of capturing the fact that the lower atmosphere closely interacts with the soil surface and does not float in unbounded space. As Latour and others dryly note in passing, if we pollute the atmosphere or mess it up, there is no other horizon to which we could escape, contrary to the impression given by the traditional planetary view. This dream of leaving Earth may in fact be the most significant aspect um, of the planetary view today. Um, just as it encouraged extending the frontier on a planetary map. So, the, you know, this idea of just mapping the, um, the globe, the surface of the globe in longitude and, uh, and, and, longitude and latitude um, encouraged the idea of extending the frontier on a planetary map, finding new spaces to conquer and annex to the territory that one believes one owns. So today, the same view, 
um, this planetary view of the Earth encourages extending that frontier into outer space, discovering exoplanets in case we mess up this one. The masculinity of domination from Bezos and Branson to Musk still hinges on colonizing space, a fantasy at once so fierce and so fragile that one must expect its illusions to engender all sorts of further violence. By contrast, what I'm calling the geokinetic view of the Earth as a mobile biofilm whose dynamic interactions sustain life locates us on the inside without escape. Now, as the pandemic showed, we don't like lockdowns, and especially not a lockdown inside a lockdown. Hence, it's so hard to accept this view, I would say. When we say that human generations take turns with the Earth, we should not imagine the currently living as handing over to the next turn taker and object, the planet, that is in their hands to begin with, right? So I don't, when I say generations take turns with the earth, then I don't want us to think of, you know, one generation holding the globe in its hands and just handing it over to the next generation. That doesn't capture um, this idea that uh, human life is constituted by these uh, processes of the Earth, so that we're internal to the Earth rather than on the outside, as if we could hold the globe in our hands. And you all know these images of we need to save the planet, we need to, you know, and then you have someone holding it uh, in their hands, right? Rather, being inside the biofilm that sustains us, as it did our ancestors and should sustain our descendants, the Earth constrains us to leave behind, that is to take turns with, that which we could not ever keep in our hands. We owe the Earth to the future because, and this is the crux of the normative ontology of what I call natal mortality and turn taking, we cannot not leave it behind. We owe the Earth because we are of it, living on its inside, terre à terre. Just as our corpses will necessarily be reabsorbed by the Earth, processed by other organisms for new life, the generation after us will have to decide what to do with our terrestrial legacy. So, I'm almost done. I'm just going to go and get the light going again. So forgive me for that. Um, it's good to get up every once in a while, though. So um, the last one here, last slide. My corpse, whether inhumed or cremated or fed to the vultures, will be claimed by terrestrial elements. Uh, we live our lives as already interred, in earthed, and in earthing. That is. Um, in French, I don't know how to do this in, in Italian, I'm sorry, enterré, enterrant. You know, so we are in, we are in earth, um, but we also bury our dead, right? uh, as it were. So it was always a generational task. Uh, and it is because we are of the earth that we have to take care of um, a generation before us and after us. That's what I'm trying to say. So in German, I would say, forgive me, we are beerdigt, beerdigend, right? So uh, you get that, right? Uh, interred and interring, enterré, enterrant. You and I are living with earth others uh, in and not merely on the earth. Humans are both interred, that is agonistically belonging to a larger time and space here called earth, and interring, marked from the beginning by outliving and being outlived, and that means by responsibilities for returning others as well as one's remains to the earth. This is the point of saying that we are taking turns with that, which also takes turns with us. With us. But the point is, despite the factual inevitability of this revolution, despite this taking of turns happening nolens volens, its internal normativity asks us to unfold it so as to take a fairer turn. That in a, is in a nutshell why the second Copernican revolution needs the intergenerational turn, that is needs an account of um, intergenerational justice, just as much as being geologically human does. Without the normativity and timescale of human generations inside the critical zone, the second Copernican revolution will lack the right kind of profitual motivation and understanding of our generational being. So, tour à tour and terre à terre, such as the human condition today, tour à terre, terre à tour. Thank you. Thanks indeed. Thanks indeed, uh, Professor Sisius. Thanks indeed, Matthias. Uh, really 
inspired but also really really dense uh, uh, paper that you presented and delivered to us uh, and as far as I have understood this is a piece of your present day research and we are really really happy that you uh, delivered that shared uh, with uh, with you uh, with, with us and with this audience uh, uh, um, your paper and your uh, your proposals with uh, um, by the way recommended to we all uh, what a philosopher uh, should uh, do so give names to things and uh, you are trying to give new names to new things and in this sense i'm really indebted to you for this uh, and for this uh, attempt very successful theoretical attempt that you deliver to us um, in uh, in the meantime, as you notice it, uh, immediately after your start, uh, uh, Professor Randina uh, Tiziana arrived to our conversation, and I, I would uh, give to her uh, the floor in order to manage and, and to deal uh, and to lead the, the 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 second part of our seminar. So please, uh, Tiziana, the floor is yours uh, for the, the the second part of the debate. Thanks indeed. Thank you, Alberto, and thank you, Matthias, for this very, very brilliant and inspiring talk. Uh, it was a pleasure um, to 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 hear and to uh, reflect on your view, which is very complex uh, and interesting to me. Uh, I can open the discussion with with a, with a question, and, and, and other person can can uh, rise their virtual end or uh, send the write the, the question in the chat as they prefer. Um, just to start, uh, for as far, uh, as, far uh, as I understand your point, I think that uh, your view is uh, really interesting to me, especially because uh, um, if I understand you correctly, uh, you are trying to offer a new approach in ontology in order to support uh, um, the reflection on intergenerational justice. Um, and this is especially interesting because uh, it opened the possibility for uh, a more complex uh, reflection on this point. Now, uh, just come back to the final part to, of, of your, uh, uh, sorry, to the first part of your presentation. At some point, you, uh, you write uh, uh, something, you wrote something like this. Uh, the subject of uh, the subject of an action is not humanity. I don't know if you remember the point, but uh, uh, a generation. So we we have to uh, change our, our attention when we reflect on action from humanity as a whole to generation. So my point is, uh, uh, can I have some more ideas about uh, what from the ontological perspective? I mean, uh, to uh, which kind of action are you uh, are you referring? Uh, every type it's necessary to, to 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 change our perspective, reflecting on every social action, or you are referring to a particular type of action. This is the first point. The second one is about uh, your notion of generation. Um, you often use the words generation, obviously, uh, but I'm curious about uh, the definition you try to adopt. Uh, what do you mean for uh, for generation? Uh, you, you are adopting a conceptual uh, notion, um, or sociological notion, uh, or, or what else? Yeah, thank you for your question and hello, uh, Professor Andina. In fact, I had not noticed that you had joined us um, because, uh, you know, it's only very few of you that I could see while I was sharing my screen. But uh, yeah, welcome and uh, happy to meet you in this way. Um, yeah, those are very good questions and I thank you for them. Um, uh, when it comes to a generation, um, yes, I did not define that here um, in, 
you know, it's always problematic to just, you know, refer to stuff you've done elsewhere when such a good question in this context is asked. Um, but um, I, I distinguish five different senses of generation in the first chapter of Taking Turns with the Earth. And um, I favor what, I, uh, what is called the, in the literature, that's not my invention, um, the idealized familial concept of generations. But I find something worthwhile in some of the other concepts um, as well. So, um, what is the idealized uh, familial concept of generation? It is one that stresses overlap. I think it is very, very important in general terms that uh, w just as we, um, this was the focus of my talk today, just as uh, we should understand ourselves as being of the earth, we should always understand ourselves also as being of a generation. Um, and so what I call generativity or what, um, intergenerational psychologists and economists call generativity um, is very important. Um, what in, um, in Levinas, uh, who is important to, to my work on this too, is called fecundity. Uh, so that um, future generations are of us just as we are of a previous generation. So that there is a connection um, that um, is um, biological, yes, but uh, not just biological. It extends mm -hmm. into the ontology that you're asking about here in your question. Um, so the um, idealized familial uh, uh, conception stresses that overlap and so that roughly speaking, there are three generations at any one time living. Yeah. Okay, so, but yeah. it, it is still important to talk about generation in this view because it seems that you are moving your perspective uh, to conceive a, a sort of unique uh, subject. So humanity is a sort of unique subject uh, in your view, as far as I know as far as I understand. So if you adopt this kind of approach, is still necessary to talk about uh, differentiation in terms of generation? Yes, for the reason that I gave, namely that I think in particular, the uh, unit of uh, profitural concern should not be humanity, but should be um, put in terms of generations. So, um, but uh, of course we are, talking about human generations, but human generations um, as embedded in uh, the thin biofilm of life. And so interconnected with uh, land, territory, um, plants, um, animals, um, bacteria, and so on. Um, so uh, yes, we are, I mean, I am a defender of um, uh, the idea that um, many of the environmental concerns today um, can and should be captured in terms of uh, human generations um, and not just in terms of your know, nature as such or earth as such and so on. So, um, but I also want to say, yeah, but we should not conceive of that humanity as if uh, its real location was somewhere out in, out, uh, in, in space, right? So, such as Kant thought, you know, looking out um, towards the, the starry skies above him, uh, he thought that very well. Uh, humanity may settle elsewhere in the universe. And that I think is, is a sentiment that's very much with us today. So, um, yeah. so I do think in terms of human generations, but I think of uh, human generations as a deeply, deeply embedded in terrestrial processes. And that's what I'm trying to capture here. Um, uh, ontologically, but also normatively. And that's why it gets a little tricky and a little complicated, and I apologize for that, but I, I want to say that human generations are taking turns with the earth, but since these generations are also deeply, deeply embedded and co-constituted by the earth in its um, geokinetic processes, uh, they, are, they must be understood as not taking turns with an external object, but with something that co-constitutes them. And that's why I speak of this anchoring and I speak of this counter agency and that's where things get a little um, uh, uh, messy conceptually perhaps, but I, I think it is something that we need to confront. That's what I was trying to say. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to generation, there's always a question of individuation. Where does a generation begin? Where does it end? Um, and um, I, uh, not here, but elsewhere, I have tried to suggest that I think that um, the turn-taking model can help us there. Um, namely, that when you have a, a crisis in the object of turn-taking, that triggers the individuation. 
Uh, so when you're taking turns with a bicycle, you're just taking turns with it. And if it's just working and working and working, um, there is no issue. Um, then there is no question of an individuation um, because it's not necessary. But when um, the bicycle breaks down, uh, then the turn takers have to sort of think of each other and have to reflect on. So who took the last turn? Who is going to be the next turn taker? And what exactly are the obligations that hold between them? And that, I think, is our situation with the environment today. Um, that is, uh, you could say, you know, sometime in 1990, maybe you want to put this further back, uh, but sometime in 1990, maybe 1992, the first Rio conference that put, um, you know, the, uh, the, the COP negotiations um, to which Alberto will go in Glasgow um, at the end of this month um, uh, into place, uh, that is somewhere where a generation becomes uh, unified or individuated as a result of the crisis in its object to which it is responding. Um, and so this is how I get to um, the individuation. So it's a, it's a very historical account of, yeah. of, of a generation at the same time. And uh, this is why I'm trying to say there are other concepts of generation out there, such as the one that when you speak of the lost generation, when it comes to World War One. Um, uh, or we speak of, um, you know, a generation X and so on. So we have very um, uh, specific cultural historical references to constitute the idea of a generation that some of that is useful because you need it in order to account for the individuation of a generation. And then that generation, um, yes, it is human, but it is not humanity as such, right? It's not humanity as an uh, a historical concept. Um, uh, but it is humanity as always temporally divided, uh, as it were, divided, but also linked, of course. Um, and it is that ge generation that I want to think of as having actionable um, obligations, such as mm -hmm. with respect to climate, for example, namely to pass it on in a state that taking turns says is a fair turn with um, that object of turn taking, and then you can talk about what is a fair turn, and I'd, I'd be I'd be happy to elaborate. But it's, it goes a little bit further than your question. Okay, thank you. Just go to. Okay, Martina Zanetti, Martina. Yes, uh, thank you for your speech. Um, I would say that um, your TT analysis um, is included in a post-human perspective. What is the relationship between your analysis and post-humanism? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, so I have tried to uh, situate my analysis here in this talk vis-a-vis -vis the discussion of um, the Anthropocene and the major goal was to situate it vis-a-vis -vis those kinds of discourses. Um, but, uh, you know, I did reference post-humanism when I introduced Chakrabarti uh, and I, I really wanted to say that Chakrabarti is, is a post-humanist uh, historian in the sense that he's, he's um, uh, you know, he's became well known for writings um, against a Eurocentric uh, humanistic perspective. Um, and so I would hope that my perspective is um, in line with that uh, to the extent that it, it seeks to be critical of um, a, a traditional humanism uh, that often betrays a Eurocentric perspective. Um, and I, I hope that my uh, perspective is, uh, in that sense, also uh, post-humanist. Where this came up uh, in my talk a few times, I think, and I'm actually working on this more in some, some other areas, um, is in the references to indigenous perspectives on um, climate change. I think it's very interesting to read um, indigenous perspectives on climate change, indigenous responses to that. Um, and I, I, uh, I was trying to say in this talk only in passing that I hope that um, my, um, my talk uh, is, in, is in agreement uh, with um, these critiques of um, Anthropocene discourses. Um, and I, I tried to do that in part by um, calling for uh, distinctions between generations and not casting our vision of the future in terms of the human or uh, humanity, but in terms of generations. And I think that that is a perspective that is more in line with uh, 
um, indigenous and, and uh, post-humanist indigenous perspectives that are um, that also, um, and I, this is very important to me, that also um, understand our life in such a way that uh, any outlook towards the future is inseparable from a relationship to ancestors. So it's uh, inseparable from a relationship with the past. Um, and uh, when I briefly talked about um, uh, asymmetrical reciprocity, um, then this came out. And I think that most in post-humanist indigenous perspectives on climate ethics and climate change um, are um, such that they uh, correspond with a view of um, relations between generations that are reciprocal in a way that is not just looking towards the future, but is also looking towards the past. In other words, the present generation should understand itself as um, not only the ancestor of the future, but also the future of the ancestors, so the descendants of the ancestors. And for me, this is where um, the post post-humanism comes in um, most uh, directly. Of course, there are other linkages, such as in the view that um, uh, human beings are uh, constituted by, um, by the earth, so are of the earth and inseparable in that sense from, from, from land and from, from territory, uh, but also from uh, what I call geokinetic processes. So mobilities within the earth itself. Does that help? Yes, perfect. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. It's really helpful. Other question? Israel. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving this. Very, very. Can Can you talk? Uh, can you speak uh, near the Microsoft? Microsoft. Do you hear me? Yeah. No, better. it's better. Is it better now? Okay. Better, better. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I was wondering. Actually, I come, I come back in a certain sense to the first question of Professor Andina, uh, to uh, concerning the the who, the whom uh, we are, uh, we have to address to. Uh, I, I, I explain myself. I mean, Hans Jonas, that you mentioned briefly. Uh, he he uh, asks. He says very clearly that, well, of course, that in the in the indefinite future, as he puts, um, much more than the contemporary space of action, uh, that um, uh, it, it is it is the indefinite future actually uh, mu much more than the, the 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 present, the contemporary space of action that constitutes the the relevant horizon of responsibility. So he for maybe was one of the first that connects this uh, uh, thought about the intergenerational uh, um, concern and and ecology, right? But uh, he also he also says very clearly uh, who uh, regarding the who uh, who is the action um, uh, necessary to be taken. He says, well, neither you nor I, it is the collective actor and, and it's the collective action that counts, not the individual actor that is at stake here mainly. Of course, that uh, he is he um, he, he's concerned about a new moral that needs to invest uh, the, the individual sphere of action, but he thinks very much of the collective action and, and the collective actors, right? So he he is concerned on, on how the the responsibility will invest the public the public sphere. So I, I was wondering um, uh, for you what what is your opinion about how to put this concern of intergenerational justice in the realm of of the of the public discussion uh, and public communication? Because one thing is is uh, uh, to think about it in uh, within the cosmogonies, the cosmologies of of indigenous people, because they are embedded with with this view. But somehow this view was lost in our Western or Westernalized uh, uh, thought and and action. So how to to put it be, uh, back and 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 made it to be central in the in the public sphere. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Israel. That is uh, also a very good question. Um, you could say a question about political strategy um, uh, that uh, ties back to uh, Professor Andina's um, 
uh, question about the subject of action, and maybe I have not um, successfully addressed it, and maybe maybe we have to think about this together. Uh, so I, this is a question where, um, as a uh, as a philosopher working with various concepts here, I, I may not. Um, you know, I, I should not be the one who has all the answers. Uh, so, uh, in a certain way, it's a question for all of us. And um, I, I say this not just out of humility. I also say this because it's a political question. Um, it's a question of political strategy. Uh, and and here, uh, I'd be very happy um, to hear all kinds of um, uh, input. You know, as much input as possible. I don't think, though, that asymmetrical reciprocity and uh, taking turns only have um, indigenous roots, um, and, um, and they also have uh, non-indigenous roots. I mean, I uh, I developed the notion of taking turns first in a reading of Aristotle's Politics um, because it's the only place I know of in the Western tradition where taking turns um, has been taken up as a model of justice. However, it is only with respect to offices, political offices, but plays a very very important role there. Um, but it's not with respect to objects. Right? It's not with respect to the earth or uh, such, but it is with respect to institutions. And so that's already quite interesting. Um, and there is a lot to be learned from that discussion um, in uh, in Aristotle's politics. And then it gets picked up by by Derrida, and that's why I, I first discovered it and did, you know and worked it up and so on. So there are other sources for this. Um, uh, and I think that's important, actually. Uh, I work a lot with Marcel Mauss, and uh, Marcel Mauss's view um, also makes a reference um, to uh, Roman traditions, uh, Roman legal traditions, um, when it comes to the discussion of the gift. So the gift is another way of talking about uh, indirect or asymmetrical reciprocity, um, and also makes uh, reference to Germanic traditions, um, not just to the Tlingit um, of the Pacific Northwest in North America and the Maori and so on, but there are other sources there. Um, and I think that is revealing in a certain way. I mean, I started the talk by talking about uh, taking turns, and one of the things that I think is good about it is that, you know, I can go to Japan or China and give a talk on this kind of material, and people can relate to it right away, even if the, the, the terms used for uh, what a turn is are already so different in different languages. In German, it is very difficult to say to take a turn uh, with something, with an object. Very difficult to say. Can be said, but not so elegantly as in, in English, for example. And uh, in French, you, you cannot take a turn with something. You can only um, pass it to, you can pass it up. And I don't know about Italian, um, but it, you know, you already have all kinds of differences there, but also there, I think there is a common intuition there. So I wouldn't say that it is just uh, um, an indigenous source where we have this question of, um, how can we reintroduce it to um, the publics of Western civil societies? Um, I would say that, um, you know, uh, of course, there's always uh, conceptual work on the part of uh, philosophy that is necessary and, and others, of course, you know, theorists more broadly. Um, but it's also good to have concepts that are um, capable of um, embedding and picking up by um, by communities themselves. Um, so, so I do think that uh, it would be helpful to introduce notions of uh, intergenerational reciprocity and taking turns um, among generations into the public at large. I think it would be good for us to have a public discussion around what is fair with respect to the climate, for example. Um, what is a fair term with um, the next generation when it comes to the climate? What should be um, the upper limit of um, CO2 emissions and methane emissions and so on. What would be what should be the upper limit there? One way of phrasing this uh, would be to, to to talk about taking turns with the climate. Right? And in the book, there's a little bit more on how you fill that with normative content. Um, and I, I can I can talk about that, but that's not what your question is about. So I think that part of the advantage of um, the notion of taking turns is that. Um, it can make it into the public sphere and, and can um, invigorate debates um, in civil society. And I think it is something that can apply at the individual level. Um, so you can think about what would be a fair turn, um, but it can also, um, and this is how I primarily think about it, um, it can apply at the collective level. Um, and so I, I do think um, in terms of strategy that, 
uh, the institutional mechanisms that we have need to be uh, utilized as much as we can, in part because of urgency, and urgency is an important consideration because we're talking about political strategy. So I think it's quite urgent that we, we start um, asking um, about this. Um, and and addressing it. So um, and then there is a uh, there is a question as to whether um, and this goes back also to Professor Andina's question whether it needs to be situated at the level at the global level um, as Stephen Gardner, for example, recently at the conference I was talking about earlier uh, argued. So uh, Gardner thinks that we need a global constitutional convention in order to address intergenerational buck passing. That's what he's working on right now. Um, and I'm not taking a stance on that here, um, but I, I, do, I do find it interesting. But as you noticed in my talk, also always worrying as soon as you start talking about humanity. Because you, you have all kinds of questions of distribution of responsibilities within that. I okay, hope. thank you. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, was Fausto, Fausto Corvino. Yes. Thank you very much, Matthias, for your great talk. Really interesting and inspiring. Uh, I have a question about the, I mean, your more general idea of intergenerational justice, your turn taking account, let's say, because you say that it's in line with common intuitions. Uh, you said in one of these slides. Um, and I, I was thinking that actually someone could object to this through the famous toffee apple example by, by Brian Berry. Um, I, I'm not, I mean, I don't want to criticize you because I really like your theory. I think it's a groundbreaking theory. I, I'm just sincerely curious to know how you would respond to this kind of objection. Like Brian Berry, when he says, does the fact that I find the toffee apple out of the blue entail that I have a duty to offer a toffee apple to another person? You, usually I make this kind of example. I mean, uh, assume that I invite, for example, Alessandro Chiesi uh, for, for lunch. Um, and this, and they accept my invitation, and, and he thinks, okay, I will reciprocate the next time. But then I have to leave Pisa because, for example, someone is trying to kill me. So Alexandro Chiesi cannot reciprocate, reciprocate, cannot invite me for lunch. I mean, it's not so, it's not so intuitive that he has to offer lunch to Alberto Pirni, for example, because I'm no longer available, and I offer him the first lunch. So someone could say, well, the idea of turn taking as any kind of in theory of intergenerational justice that is based on indirect reciprocity is not so in line with common intuition. Um, so I, I just wanted to know how would you respond to this? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, again, it's always problematic when you say that, um, you know, I've addressed this elsewhere and just go look there and I don't mean to do this, but there is a longer discussion I have of that in a recent paper in a book that's called, um, with the title Future Design, um, that came out with the Sh Springer uh, last year. So um, yeah, if you want, I, I, you know, I can email you the reference, but really, uh, forgive me, I have to, find that. if you can still hear me, um, I, First of all, Brian Berry, in the very same passage uh, in which he discusses the toffee ap apple example, so, and I also explicitly um, use that example, um, he says that, yes, but if the passing around of toffee apples is part of an established practice, then it does obligate a return. Uh, right, so it's very important what the history of this practice is. And so, you know, the way he phrases it is, of course, um, you know, deliberately designed to trigger the intuition that it doesn't really um, cause any kind of obligation because he says it's out of the blue. I think that's the important thing. It's also that the toffee apple is a gratuitous thing, right? Uh, it's something that is uh, like candy, right? It's something that you don't necessarily need unless you're giving it to a really hungry person. Um, uh, and, um, and it is out of the blue. And so those are two stipulations that I find um, uh, offer me a way of responding. When we're talking about the climate, when we're talking about the earth, when we're talking about the way in which uh, living processes on the earth uh, constitute uh, generations, then obviously we're not talking about gratuitous items. We're talking about items that are life constituting um, and uh, provide the background for um, uh, generations to come on stage and to, to live and, and have generations themselves. Um, and so that's the first thing. It is not a toffee apple that we're talking about. We're talking about climate, environment, and so on. Um, 
Um, and, but we're also talking about infant care and elderly care and so on. Um, and, uh, and the second point is that it's not out of the blue, uh, right? But it is part of an established practice um, that um, habitable biospheres are passed on. Um, and, and so uh, in the um, analytic literature, I, um, you have, for example, a longer discussion of um, when reciprocity obtains um, that focuses on established um, practices, as Barry does. Barry says right away, if it's part of an established practice, there is an obligation generated, which is important, right? Because it's then, it brings in the question of history, histories of practices and so on. But also, I think in this series of talks, you will have uh, Edward Page um, give um, a talk at some point. Is that correct, Fausto? Uh, yeah, and uh, he has uh, he has um, written about reciprocity duties in the intergenerational context, where he says, drawing on some work by George Klosko and others, that when the goods in question are pre that's what how that's the term they use presumptively beneficial, then they uh, generate an obligation uh, after all. So again, it pertains to the gratuitousness of the toffee apple, and and so. You know, so there's the established practice, there's the historicity of that practice on the one hand, which again brings in questions of ancestry and so on, but there is also then um, the uh, the content of that which is um, transferred. So when it comes to the lunch example, then um, I think uh, you need to think about, is it an established practice? Um, you know, that um, colleagues take each other out for lunch. Uh, and if it is, then it does generate obligations, even on Brian Berry's own tally. Thank you, you convinced me. <laughs> yes, and okay. I, I will give you the reference, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we can, uh, we can take uh, the last two questions together. The first one was uh, Alessandro Chiesi, and the last one uh, is Alberto. Thank you very much um, for for very exciting uh, paper. And uh, more or less, my question is in the line of Professor Andina and uh, Israel uh, Barroso um, uh, thinking. And as far as I understand your paper, there is a sort of reference to the idea of Earth as a system and environment. And so uh, the idea uh, I understand is that justice more or less uh, is connected to the concept of Earth and broadly to nature, if I'm not wrong. And so, uh, my question is uh, how to, uh, what I can say, oblige or make a sort of constraint, uh, constraint to people when we are talking about the, 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 the global warming and policies connected to global warming, uh, to, to make uh, maybe choices that are not uh, uh, defending the, the interest or the economical interest, because as we discussed at the beginning of the paper, outside uh, your paper, there is a difference between rich and poor, and uh, at the same time, uh, the, the rich uh, usually impose his view, and uh, they view are not uh, maybe the safer for uh, for the earth of the system. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, did you want to take another question, or should I try to respond? Uh, Matthias, oh, uh, yeah. You. Okay. Um, well. That is a very good question, and what we really need is a theory of justice that connects intergenerational issues with global issues. Uh, and uh, that takes, I mean, this is what my, my paper is pointing to, and I would entirely agree with you that that is exactly what we need. You always need that when you are talking about intergenerational justice, uh, because um, the question is mm, when, you know, when is it imperative to give to the future rather than to the needy in the present? So that is always a question that you have to address. One of the things um, I would say, or well, maybe two things. Um, one is about um, asymmetrical reciprocity or indirect reciprocity, and the other one is about taking turns. Um, when it comes to reciprocity, I think that um, one of the advantages of indirect reciprocity, so three-party uh, reciprocity, not two-party reciprocity, so not exchange, but uh, indirect reciprocity, is that there is an open question as to um, there's an open question as to. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting some interference here. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Someone has the microphone open. I think he's 
Israel, Israel, can you turn off the microphone? Please? I really apologize for that. <laughs> really apologize. Okay, thank you. Sorry. No worries. Um, so, um, I mean, I, uh, indirect reciprocity is three party reciprocity, as Fausto explained. You know, I get lunch from uh, Alberto, and, uh, uh, but, um, but I, I do not necessarily owe it to Alberto. I may owe it to, um, to Alessandro uh, or, or someone else. If, forgive me for using your first name. Um, and uh, the, then there's always the question when you have received something on this three party model, there's always a question of who is now the most worthy recipient. Um, and that's why I think indirect reciprocity is kind of a baseline normativity. Um, and it is connectable with, and it asks for elaboration and sub supplementation by other forms, uh, other accounts of justice. Uh, in terms of equality, uh, in terms of sufficiency and so on, all these important discussions. I'm not um, doing that myself, but I do think that those discussions um, are, they, they come in at this point, but they need to respect asymmetrical reciprocity as the baseline normativity, right? Because then you need to answer the question, who is the most worthy recipient? Um, and it could be that the answer is, um, well, it is the global poor in the present rather than in the in the future. Um, but I would say you are making a decision there and you should be aware of that decision because asymmetrical reciprocity asks you to pay forward. There's always the question of the future generation. So you cannot just privilege the present simply because out of a presentist mindset, you must um, give a justification for why you're privileging the present at the expense of the future, if it is at the expense of the future. And that's what, asymm that's what asymmetrical reciprocity asks you to do. Be aware that there is the obligation um, to give to the future, right? And so now you're giving to the future, but privileging the present in doing so. And what is the justification for that? Um, that's what asymmetrical reciprocity asks you to do. When it comes to taking turns, it is, it's seeking to respect what I call natal mortality or uh, mortal uh, natality. So kind of a combination of um, the work of Hannah Arendt and, and, and Heidegger and, and Levinas. Um, uh, elsewhere, I've uh, elaborated on that. Um, and uh, taking turns, um, I think it suggests thinking of boundary constraints um, that uh, pertain to the present as well as to the future. So when you take turns with um, a particular object, um, then um, uh, when it comes to a bicycle, for example, um, or with a lunch or, or something, maybe lunch is a more difficult example, but then there are certain kind of boundary constraints. I mean, the lunch pre presumably couldn't consist in just passing toffee apples around, right? That's not that we don't think that's a lunch, right? When it comes to taking turns, I think um, we have objects uh, in question. So you take turns with a bicycle and then the, let's say minimally, the bicycle should still be a bicycle when you pass it on. Right? And then you can fill that with more content. It has to work for the next turn taker, has to be passed on in the same condition, at least as good as you got it, um, or it has to be flourishing as the kind of thing that it is. So there, this is how I talk about it uh, elsewhere. And so uh, you can then fill it with further contents, but, but all of these contents will pertain to boundary constraints and maybe something like uh, what scientists have uh, called planetary boundaries you know, the nine planetary boundary view um, of uh, the Earth system uh, is applicable here. So taking turns um, fills the content as to what is owed uh, with a greater um, uh, detail. And those details, I would argue, pertain both to the global poor as well as um, to future generations, namely um, in, in see seeking to stay within those planetary boundaries. Please, Alberto. Thank you very much. This is the last, um, last question. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tiziana, and thanks again uh, to Matthias. Uh, first of all, let me see that I'm really happy and courageous to, to, to have the opportunity to, to meet you in person uh, at the end of this month in, in Glasgow and uh, hoping to have a fruitful uh, experience. Uh, we will see, you know, <laughs> it's an historical event. I'll be happy to pay for lunch. Ah, well. <laughs> Last but not least, and perhaps also the, the, the public transportation are included in a sort of a comprehensive assessment, but this is another story, <laughs> let's see. But okay, by, by jumping again, 
the discussion we had so far. Um, as soon as I, I listen to you and also by uh, assisting to the debate, I have the, impri the, the impression to, to, to be in presence uh, of, in a, of a sort of a platonic chariot of cart, if I may summarize in these terms, like the, that one uh, uh, raised up or evocated in the Phaedrus. No? Uh, I mean, we have two different forces, if I may call it, or two different forces, if I can call uh, them in this way. On the one hand, we have a, a very strong normative effort, which was uh, set up uh, at the very beginning in the section one and perhaps two and three, and then a more descriptive, uh, descriptive force, which was uh, at the very end in the first section, but also in the fourth one. I was one, let me try, I don't know if you agree first with this uh, uh, picture, but uh, it, is, it is evocative of a, of a different uh, point of departure of your very interesting paper and, uh, and your theoretical position, first of all. Let me try to be a little bit more uh, sharp in, uh, in what I'm saying. Uh, first sub-issue is related to the normative side. And uh, uh, on this point, I was wondering, uh, together with Tiziana, which is the meaning of uh, of generation, but more uh, larger. How large is now the usage of your term intergenerational? How large, and I would say how deep? Because you started by, um, by, by pointing out the, the idea of a geological consciousness. But uh, uh, to me, from a normative point of view, uh, 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 as much as we enlarge the predictability of the intergenerationality, uh, we are assuming that we are better, we are opening the floor or the door to, uh, to weak forms of moral slash political responsibility. To say, as much as we are, as less we are responsible for what we did, what we are trying to do. And this has to do uh, with the second part of, the, of your paper. Which is, uh, um, which is after the, let's say, the detour of the attempt to recap or uh, integrate the, the very idea of intergenerational justice, you ended up by, by quoting, in any case, not just by quoting, but rephrasing and, and using the, the rationale by Latour or other, other scholars. No? Uh, and very interesting, by the way, that the last part, Berdig and Berdig. And, uh, inerted and inerted, uh, inerting. Huh? But in the very end, uh, is there something which can be called as a sort of global subject? I mean, uh, we as uh, speeches, we are trying to do, in a sense, our best for, let's say, being part of this second, sec second Copernican revolution. But are we sure that we are able to coordinate our effort with the other ones that are at stake. I mean, the, the animals or the nature or the atmosphere or, or the bacterians. Uh, we know that this is also a segment that Latour uh, touched upon. So in which sense can we predicate that we are on the same page? We are uh, uh, um, moving towards the same goal or better we are all uh, I don't want to say victims, but in a sense, subject of the, of the same, in the same uh, uh, level of gravity, having in mind the wonderful image of this second, uh, second Copernican revolution. So uh, in, if we stay within the, the narrative of the big actors or the uh, antro or post-anthropocenic act actor, don't we lose the possibility to coordinate action, our comprehensive action to the other ones. And in this, in this sense, perhaps also we lose the link to the, uh, to the um, three paths or the, the inter, in, indirect reciprocity eh? and uh, the, 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 let's say the step back uh, the, or the, step, the steps back to the normative effort. I mean, the intergenerational justice, the, uh, the, um, uh, the approach to which we are uh, trying to deal with uh, uh, an intergenerational justice of, uh, uh, perspective, and last but not least, uh, even the intergenerational effort we're trying to assume as a requirement of your proposal. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, thank you Thanks very much. Th yes, those are um, very good considerations and um, forgive me if I won't be able to address them uh, fully here, perhaps. Um, and, uh, you know, I take them under advisement and I will be happy to reflect further on them. But there are a few things I'd like to say in response. Maybe very briefly, um, at the most basic level, uh, I, um, I hope to avoid a strong distinction between the prescriptive and the descriptive. Um, so that's why I speak of a normative ontology. Um, and um, and I, I think that you find this normative ontology um, in, um, in the phenomenological tradition. Um, uh, so you find it in Levinas, you find it in uh, Hannah Arendt and, 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 uh, and in Heidegger, where normativity always emerges with, uh, with um, a, uh, con considerations of time, where time is not just linear and it's not just um, uh, given. So, I mean, that, that is just a, a very general reference, but that's not to say that it couldn't be the case. There are, there are more normative considerations and there are more descriptive considerations. I'm just saying, uh, in our um, modern uh, uh, first Copernican world, uh, we tend to distinguish very, very strongly between the, uh, the descriptive that describes uh, nature as it is without any normativity. And then we're talking about uh, the normative and usually we locate the normative within the human cultural realm. And by, by talking about um, the way in which uh, we are off the earth, I'm trying to um, cut through that division uh, between an inert nature that is without any any um, normativity and uh, human culture where all the normativity and all the agency is located, uh, just so that we, we don't uh, misunderstand one another. So, for example, I argued that we owe to the to the future in part because uh, we are always um, embedded uh, in natural processes uh, that leave a remainder. So uh, we can't, that this is the part of the meaning of the, um, uh, the in-earthed and the uh, in-earthing um, or the uh, interred and the interring. So uh, you cannot imagine a human life without the responsibility of handling the corpses from the previous generation. And, but you also cannot imagine um, a human life as it is constituted on the earth without leaving bodily remains to the next generation. So you're always connected to them. You always have uh, ideas and projects and so on with respect to the next generation because you're leaving something to them. Um, and, um, you know, that this could be elaborated, but it has to do with our earthly constitution. We are bodies that are embedded in life processes that are much bigger than we are. And that's why I refer to um, our um, taking turns, as it were, with um, the environment in which we live. Uh, so, you know, we breathe out uh, CO2 in higher quantities than we breathe it in, um, and our plants uh, reprocess that. Uh, we leave our bodies uh, to the earth, and there's no way that you can avoid that, right? Um, and um, those bodily remains will be reprocessed. Uh, so there is, a, um, and, and so, and my, my point is just to say, well, but then there are better or worse ways of leaving it. And so you, you always must leave, but there are better or worse ways of leaving it. And that for me is the source of normativity. And, but it isn't cut off uh, from, from the descriptive. It is part of our earthly and generational constitution to be like this. That is the meaning of this um, terra terre, tour a tour at the end, uh, right? That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. Um, now, uh, when it comes to generations, um, how, lo how large and how deep, um, uh, and, um, you know, I was, arguing against geological con consciousness, right? I was, uh, at least in the way that I know these discourses, namely that they tend to uh, ask us to think of ourselves as geologically constituted and just that. Um, and I wanna say, well, yeah, but you know, that is a very, very large timeline, way too large for us to act on. And this may also trigger um, very, very different motivations. It may lead us to shrug our shoulders and say, why should we be, taking turns with the climate, you know, in uh, seven and a half billion years, uh, the earth will be swallowed by the sun anyway. What's the point? Yeah. When you start thinking in these timelines, uh, then generations are just gone and there's no more generational concern. So that is why it may be important to think of us as uh, constituted by 
um, geological processes, but these processes need to be interscaled and interlinked with generational um, constitutions and, and generational time. That is the overall point of, of my talk. And so the, a lot of the normativity there, I'm trying to bend back towards the theory of intergenerational justice. But it, it is not vulnerable, I think, to the claim that it conceives of human beings as if they could be anywhere. Um, so often um, the, the metaphors that I used, for example, in the work of uh, Tim Mulgan, who I think will also be giving a talk in this series, uh, and he also gave a talk at the conference I organized uh, two weeks ago, um, the metaphor is that of uh, the, the spaceship. So generations are just going to go on a spaceship, going to leave the earth, it's going to crush and so on. Right? That's often the metaphor that's used. And I, I think that's the wrong metaphor to use. And it's very, very telling and very problematic in my view, because intergenerational responsibilities are inseparable from our constitution as earthly beings. Um, that is my overall point. So the metaphor of the spaceship, I find very, I find problematic for that reason. Um, uh, and, and that is, um, this is what I, I'm trying to say there. So the, the long time scales, I wanna bring them down to the generational time scales. Um, and uh, when it comes to these generational time scales, um, I think it is uh, very important to always keep in mind um, overlap. Um, this is what reciprocity emphasizes. You know, all the economists that work with uh, that work on intergenerational justice, um, they work with um, overlapping generations. Uh, they may idealize a little bit here and there, but they don't abstract from overlap. And I think that's very important. So suppose that um, you know the time bomb problem in this literature. You're probably familiar with it. Why shouldn't we detonate a time bomb uh, uh, or, or plant a time bomb that's going to be detonated in 200 years or 500 years or what have you? Why shouldn't we do that? Um, well, I think that is the wrong approach, honestly, because it's always going to be the case that when it comes to um, obligations with respect to institutions, uh, planetary boundaries, uh, and so on, uh, it's not only that we have obligations to generations 200 or 500 years from now, we have, um, we have those too, I think, but they pass by the way of the more proximate generations. So even if we primarily thought about obligations uh, 200 years from now, we would nonetheless have obligations to the next generation in order to um, bring it into a position where it could take care of its obligations to that generation 200 years from now. Right, so you can never skip the um, uh, intermediate generations um, and it is a mistake to do so. Um, and that is what taking turns and um, what um, indirect reciprocity are supposed to capture as well, that there's always this question of the next generation. And um, so, but I don't think as many chain models um, do that this limits our responsibilities to only the overlapping generations as you would have it on David Gauthier's model, for example. Um, I don't think that's the case because um, I think of my obligations to the next generation as transitive, meaning that uh, I have obligations to the children in my midst to be responsible for their next generation when they are no longer children but adults, right? And so there is a transitive element that leads me all the way uh, far into the future. This is what Levinas calls fecundity generating fecundity. Um, so a responsibility that is a responsibility to the responsibility of the next generation and thereby it is a responsibility to um, making sure that the boundary conditions are in place for the next and the, um, the next after next generation to fulfill its obligations to its next generation. And by what we are doing right now uh, to the climate, um, we're making that very difficult. So we are violating not the obligations to uh, a generation 200 years from now, we are violating obligations to our uh, overlapping generation, right? So, so this is, I'm, I'm trying to bring it back to, um, to what's happening in the present as it were, and not um, uh, think of it in terms of these geological timelines. Yeah, and so the global subject, um, maybe that is the last uh, point that, um, that you addressed, um, the global subject and coming back to uh, Professor Andina's question, again, I, I'll think more about it, but the taking turns model was supposed to help me here a little bit where I talked about the individuation of generations. So 
suppose there is a, a land, uh, imagine the tragedy of the commons, uh, people are grazing their cows and whatnot, and then, you know, you have obligations to the next turn taker, right? Um, but then you have to figure out, well, who are all the turn takers? If there is a problem with the land, there is a question of its distribution that is triggered by the, the crisis in the object. Now, now it so happens that we have crises in global objects necessarily global objects, namely climate. The emissions that um, you know, I, I, I put up when I, when I drive a car, um, luckily I took my bicycle this morning, but uh, nonetheless, I, I suppose uh, the food I ate this morning for breakfast had, um, yeah, because it's still morning here, um, I, you know, I had some emissions and those emissions, they were, as you all know, they're, you don't know what effects they're gonna have. They may have effects on, on the other end of, of the globe. Um, and they likely will. Um, and so it's this cumulative uh, nature of the problem that makes it global, um, necessarily global. And so now we have this crisis in the object. Um, let's just speak of planetary boundaries again. And this crisis now falls back on the, on the subject. It sort of uh, reconstitutes the subject of the obligation in my view, the subject of the return taking obligations. Right, so some of the obligations that we have as a generation right now, they are not limited to the local land. They are not limited to the bicycle or the car. They are global, so they they call for the constitution of a global subject. But it's it that is a an empirical question, right? Sure. I mean, the 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 model of turn taking is is capable of different <clears throat> empirical inputs, if you were. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. The discussion that can be longer, but uh, I do hope for uh, another opportunity to, to have this point because it's really interesting to me as well. I mean, individual slash subject, um, collective subject are a point of a, a triggering point for any moral or political philosopher, of course. <laughs> but yeah. we have to stop here, I do imagine. Yeah, I think we have to stop here. Thank you very much again. Uh, Professor Frisch for the very fresh and interesting uh, talk, but also for the generosity in the discussion, which was uh, very, very interesting. So thank you again. We will have uh, we will have our next meeting in November, if I remember correctly, isn't it, Fausto? Yes. Probably yes. Yes. The next one is you, I think. Ah, okay, great. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So. Have a but nice that's evening. available online, so I could check. I, I'd be happy to to check in. Um, okay, so. it would be great. Of Thank course, you. I will send you the link, and then you can find everything. There. I mean, the link to the main calendar. So. Thank you again for the invitation and for your excellent questions. I, I learned a lot, and um, I hope that we can stay in touch and continue to think about these important things together. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks Thank again you very you. much. Thanks to you. Thank, Thank you to you. you. Very nice paper. Bye bye. Bye. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye to everyone. Bye.